Hi, how are you? This is Dr. Damaris Maria Grossman, and this is the Mindfully Integrative Show. Today, we have a wonderful mindful chat with Terry Tucker. He is a world-renowned motivational speaker. He's an author of many books, and he's also a dad and a, and a family member, right? And he's done a lot in his career, but he's going to talk to you today in his way of where I say mindfully integrative, but what he can do and give back to himself and to others. So let's chat. <laughs> How are you? I'm great, Damaris. Thanks for having me on. I'm looking forward to talking with you. Oh, thank you. So let's talk and say a little quick fun fact that I always ask. Little fun fact. Um, I played college basketball against Michael Jordan. That's pretty cool. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Was he really good? <laughs> no. <laughs> Amazingly good. No, actually, it was my senior year. It was his freshman year, and he uh -huh. really hadn't started to blossom into the player that he ended up being. Kind of a, a funny story, kind of a follow-up. My, my brother was the basketball coach at Loyola Academy in Chicago and coached Michael Jordan's two sons. And he said, one day I'm at practice, and I'm teaching the players a new play, and I look up. And he's like, nobody's paying attention to me. And so I kind of look over where they're looking and they were looking at the, the door to get into the gym. And Jordan had come into the gym as a dad, you know, to pick up yeah, his kids after practice. This wasn't, oh. you know, I'm Michael okay. Jordan. And so my brother looked at him and said, you know, hey, Michael, you're a little bit of a distraction. Would you mind stepping out in the hall until practice is over so I can finish? And Jordan and his wife were incredibly great people. And, and he was like, absolutely, coach, I'm sorry for the distraction. I'll, I'll wait outside. And my brother thought later, he said, you know, I'm probably the only coach in the history of basketball that ever kicked Michael Jordan out of practice. So, was... oh, I mean, it probably, it's just like, oh, you don't know what to do. Right. And then they probably want to be like perfectly, you know, that's right. pretty cool. Oh, he's just coming in as a dad. How sweet. That's pretty cool. Wow. That's really fun. That's a, that's an entertaining like thought. Like, I mean, nerve wracking, but fun. So you're a big basketball fan. You're a big sports guy, pretty athletic. I am. I, 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 well, I was, guy. yeah, I, I, I mean, you can't tell this from looking at me or from my voice, but I'm six foot eight inches tall. And, and I played college basketball at oh the Citadel goodness. in, in wow. Charleston, South Carolina, the, the brother that I mentioned who coached Jordan's son uh, is six foot seven and was a pitcher for the university of Notre Dame. And then I have another brother who's six foot six, oh who was God. drafted by the Cleveland Cavaliers, the national basketball association. And then my dad was six foot five. So I sort of joke that if you sat behind our family in church growing up, there wasn't a prayers chance you were going to see anything that was going on, you know, oh in front gosh. of us. But it was literally our five foot eight inch mother that was the boss. You know, it didn't matter how big, tall, strong we were. Whatever <laughs> mom said, that's the way it went. That's, oh, she's a boy mom, right? Oh, I'm a boy oh, mom. Oh, absolutely. I have no sisters. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I'm a boy mom too. I totally get the, the different, uh, I thought I was going to be a, a girl mom, but now I'm a boy mom. <laughs> Oh, I, yeah, I know. And, and my wife and I have one child. We have a daughter. And I, I you know, I grew up with brothers. I went to a, an all male Catholic high school. And then I went to an all male military college. So when my wife and I were having our, our child, you know, the went to the OBGYN and she's like, do you want to know what it is? We're like, yeah, sure. And she's like, well, you should buy pink. And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. You need to leave it in there until it's done. I don't know what to do with a girl. You know, it was <laughs> Oh, that's so cute. Oh, you went to military too. You were in the military. You talked to her. Well, I, I, I went to the Citadel, which is a military college. Yeah, I funny. did not go into the military. Mm -hmm. Actually, our daughter is a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy and is an oh, officer my. in the new branch of the military, the Space Force. Oh, that's exciting. I have a friend that wants to do that. That's really cool. Oh, congrats is. on her service time. That's Thank really you. cool. Awesome. Wow. That's a lot right there. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty fun fact. <laughs> so let's chat, you know, what kind of, um, you had said that you started your a new business in motivation, but obviously you have a history and a life that kind of got you to that What, you know, I, I call it integrative space, but obviously something that changed your trajectory. What, how would, did that go for you? Yeah, I, I, you know, I can look at so many different events that occurred in my life that really kind of took me down different rabbit holes and things like that. You know, when I graduated from college, I moved home to find my first job. I was the first person in my family to graduate from college. Mm -hmm. And I was all set to make my mark on the world with my newly obtained business administration degree. I look back now and realize how little I knew about business just because I had a degree. 
Fortunately, I found that first job in the corporate headquarters of Wendy's International, the hamburger chain, in their marketing department. Unfortunately, I ended up living with my parents for the next three and a half years as I helped my mother care for my father and my grandmother, who were both dying of different forms of cancer. Um, you know, as I said, professionally, you know, started out at Wendy's, I spent 10 years in hospital administration. And then I made a major pivot in my life and became a police officer and worked undercover narcotics. I was a SWAT team so hostage. What is yeah. Oh, huge. Um, I was also a SWAT team hostage negotiator, um, started my own school security consulting business, coached girls high school basketball, became an author. But for the last 10 years, probably the defining part of my life has been this uh, rare form of cancer. I have a rare form of melanoma that appeared on the bottom of my foot. And that's really been, you know, you these last rare 10... form of cancer. I, I did not read about that. Let's chat, let's chat more about this. So what yeah. you, and you've had this and so you've had chemo then move numerous times then, or, or, or... I, I have had, um, well, let, let me catch. So yeah. 2012 is when it started. So it's been a little over 10 years now. And I had a callus break open on the bottom of my foot, right below my third toe. And initially, I didn't think much of it because, right. as I mentioned, I was a high school basketball coach at the time, and you're on your feet a lot. But after right. a few weeks of it not healing, I made an appointment and went to see a podiatrist, a foot doctor friend of mine. And he took an x-ray and he said, Terry, I think you have a little cyst in there and I can cut it out. And he did. And he showed it to me. It was just a little gelatin sack with some white fat in it. No dark spots, no blood, nothing that gave either one of us concern. But fortunately or unfortunately, he sent it off to pathology. And then two weeks later, I get the call from him. And as I said, he was a friend of mine. And the more difficulty he was having explaining to me what was going on, the more frightened I was becoming until finally he just laid it out for me. He said, Terry, I've been a doctor for 25 years. I have never seen this form of cancer. You have a rare form of melanoma that appears on the bottom of the feet or the palms of the hands. And because your cancer is so incredibly rare, he recommended I go to MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston yeah. to be treated. And that's that's kind of what started this right. whole Right, it's like Odyssey. MD Anderson, St. Jude's, or, you know, up by uh, Sloan Kettering, you know, certain yeah. things are, you gotta go where specialists are. You do, you do. And and I had never, I mean, I had never heard of anybody who had melanoma on the bottom of their feet. I'm like, no, melanoma is a sun disease. It's, yeah, so you know, the melon, the pigment in your pigment in your skin. Like I never, you know, as a kid, remember laying out with my feet up in the air, you know, tan in the bottom of my feet, but it's there. So there's, there's that rare form of melanoma and there's an even rarer form of melanoma that appears in the mucous membrane. So in your nose or your mouth or something like that, but it's still melanoma. Mm, that's so, and, and there's no, they don't know genetically where, or, or what you may have gotten it or like through the. No, I, a couple summers ago, I had, um, some genetic testing done, all 88 genes at the time that they know of or suspect cause all different forms of cancer. Yeah. And I have no mutations in any of my genes for any cancer. Very interesting. Wow. It is. See how like it, you just don't know, you know, like life and health, like they don't always no, there, there's not an answer for everything in the healthcare field, you know, there isn't, but you want one, you know, you and, and I've certainly yeah, asked, you absolutely yeah. But so I mean, at least I know here. I'm not passing on, you know, bad genes to my daughter or something like that. So you are still here. You were still blessed. What exactly came from 2012 to now, right? That's 10 years. You it is. obviously have been doing things right and, and think treatments. Let's chat about that. So initially um, had the, the tumor excised on the bottom of my foot and had all the lymph nodes in my left groin removed and then had a skin graft to close the wound where the cancer had been cut out. Right. And then my oncologist at MD Anderson put me on um, a weekly injection of a drug called interferon mm -hmm. to help keep the disease from coming back. Interferon for me was a horrible, nasty, debilitating like drug. a lot. We use a lot of, Excuse me. We use it a lot for hepatitis. Yes, for the liver and right. exactly. And um, basically, I, I took a weekly interferon injection. I had severe flu-like symptoms it's for two hard, to three right? days. Yeah, every week after each injection, and I took those weekly injections for almost five years. So imagine okay. having the flu every week for five years. I remember when my oncologist suggested that. I looked at her like, "Are you crazy? This? I mean." 
That's all you, you got? want me to have the flu every week. Oh, you, you know, it's just I like, mean, not like all you got, meaning like that's the choice. This is I have. This is what I have to do. Well, and that's you know, there melanoma, and when I got it, was pretty much a death sentence. I mean, right, it right. was people are very like once you say someone says it, then they say, okay, that's it, right? You know, then yeah. you know, and then that's the hard part with the research. You want to see what's you know what's available. What else is there? You know, right. And in 2012, there wasn't a lot. And really the interferon was, as my oncologist used to say, we're trying to kick the can down the road and buy you more time. Right. So 2017, I've been on the drug for five years, end up uh, due to the toxicity of the drug, I end up in the intensive care unit with a body temperature of 108 degrees, which is you usually see, not compatible. Oh my God, people don't yeah. make it through that. And yeah. You, uh, with, it's completely septic, practically. Yeah, it, it was it was horrible. I mean, I, I remember kind of being in the ER and lifting my head up and, and I was naked from my torso up and my chest and abdomen looked like, you know, a car hood that had been out in the sun all day. You know, the, the heat was, you know, you could just see the heat rising off of it. And the funny thing about it was I was freezing. I was so cold that it was like, you know, and, and they ripped all these blankets off me. They packed me in ice. And I was like, no, you don't understand. I'm freezing. You know? <laughs> oh my and I don't remember anything after that other than waking up in the intensive care unit. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I had to stop the interferon almost immediately. The cancer came back in the exact same spot on my foot where it presented. It back came back. Okay. Oh, almost immediately. I, I mean, as soon as the interferon was stopped, it came back in the exact same area. That necessitated the amputation of my left foot in 2018. Uh, the melanoma worked its way up my leg into my shin in 2019, two more surgeries. And then in 2020, an undiagnosed tumor kind of in my ankle area and the, the, the bottom part of my what was left of my leg grew large enough that it fractured my tibia, my shin bone. And my oh only my. recourse, yeah, right in the middle of the pandemic was to have my left leg amputated above the knee and I also found out I had tumors in my lungs and I am currently being treated for those tumors as well. And this is all due to melanoma, correct? All do, it's all melanoma. Yep. Melanoma. Ah, bless your heart. Cause that's a lot. That's a lot. My, uh, I have another friend of mine that had an amputee uh, she had to get a, uh, amputated also during this mm. pandemic time. It's like, and then during pandemic. So this is a major surgeries that you needed and also having to deal with all of that too. That's a lot. Wow. So you're still dealing with your health issues to this day. You have still. this big business. Yeah. And have you felt that you've had, I mean, obviously using modern medicine, still doing that and trying to change and integrate other things to, to be better, to, to live a longer and healthier life to the best of your ability. What have you been trying to do? Yeah. I, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't have any medical background, you know, you I, have I, to I have a medical background. I, you don't. You don't, but but I've seen a lot of people that just you know take their lives and you know when they get a chronic or a terminal illness and they just turn it over to you know a doctor or a PA or so, mm -hmm. or somebody. It's like yeah, here you you manage my life and and I didn't want to do that. I mean I I have I, I am I'm living in Colorado now, so I'm affiliated with the University of Colorado Hospital now mm -hmm. uh, and and getting my therapy through them and have been for. Um, I was at MD Anderson for about a year, and then we moved here to, to Denver. And, and so, you know, my doctor used to basically track me with a PET scan, which involves injecting radioactive sugar into your body with the understanding that cancer cells are, their metabolism is higher, so they pick up the cancer at a higher rate. So you, you will see that on your scan. Well, I didn't think it took a genius to figure out, well, if, if cancer likes sugar, exactly. maybe I, I was going to say, I'm like, when did he have, I was hoping you were going to come to this conclusion. Good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, maybe I shouldn't eat a lot of sugar. And, and right. unfortunately everything we practically eat today has, has sugar in it, but I really do. I, I don't eat cookies. I don't eat bread. I don't drink pop. Mm -hmm. I don't do, you know, all the kind of things like that. I mean, I'm still going to die, but you know, at least I'm going to die healthy. So, which, <laughs> which is okay. We're all going to die. So exactly. But I, you're going to live the best life that you can. Right. And, and, and the other thing I think that I've really been lucky about is that I have access to a oncology pharmacist. So like it was suggested to me early on, hey, um, you should try high intensity uh, vitamin C therapy. And I'm like, 
okay. So I, I went out, I researched it and I'm like, okay, it seems something that might help me, but let me go ask. And so I went to, to my uh, pharmacist and I'm like, look, I want to do this. She's like, let me research it and I'll get back to you. And she came back to me and she said, Terry, you don't, you don't want to do this because the, the chemotherapy drugs that I was on at the time, she said, it will diminish their effectiveness. So we would recommend you not do that. Like, okay, that, that, that totally makes sense for me. Then I found uh, DHA, which is a, a fatty fish oil right. that's, mm -hmm. DHA. Yeah, that's DHA, supposedly yeah. really good for the heart and things like that. Right. Mm -hmm. There were some scientists over in Portugal who were doing experiments with, with heart and DHA, but found out that DHA works like kind of a Trojan horse for cancer cells, where the cancer is like, oh, that's good. I'll take it up, but it kills them. And so I went back to my pharmacist again, and I'm like, hey, I, I'm thinking I want to incorporate DHA into my diet. And she said, again, you know, let me research it. Let me get back to you. And she came back to me and she said, Terry, yeah, it makes sense, but not for you. You had a blood clot in your lung as a result of the interferon in 2017. You're on blood thinners. DHA will make you more prone to bleeding. So I don't think it's a good idea for you to do. So, I mean, I've tried a lot of things or wanted to do a lot of things, mm -hmm. but, you know, I'm, again, smart enough to say, okay, if you give me a good reason why I shouldn't do it, then, then that's fine with me. If you back some, something you're doing with science, then, then I'm okay with that. But just don't say, we don't want you to do it. Tell me why you don't want me to do it. So again, I think it kind of goes back. I want my life to be shaped by the decisions that I made, not the ones I didn't make or the ones that other people made for me. So I, I do, I read a lot. I, I get involved. I ask a lot of questions. I'm sure there are days my oncologist wants to hit me over the head with a two by four. And it's like, Terry, just do what I tell you to do, you know, but right, right. I'm just not like that. Yeah. You're, you're trying to take a little bit of control of some of yeah. these situations to the best of your ability. And at this point, are you, you know, feeling like the least stressed or are you like, do you have maybe in the sense, because you've been through so much, are you feeling better at this point in your life? I am actually, I, you know, uh, a couple months ago, my oncologist showed me my CAT scan photos back in 2020 when I had, when I found out I had the tumors in my lungs and I need my leg amputated. And like I said, I don't, I don't have any medical background, so I don't really know how to read a CAT scan, but I kind of know what should, shouldn't, shouldn't be there. Right. And I remember looking at the photos and I, I had fluid all around the pleural spaces of my lungs. Mm. I had these big tumors in my lungs and and I remember looking at my oncologist and I was like, how was I alive? And he kind of grinned and shook his head. And he's like, I don't know what, which said to me that, you know what? I, I, I mean, I, I have a very strong faith, which said to me, God's not done with me. Yet. You, you know, it's not time for me to move on. So what I'm doing now, I, I transitioned from a, a, a chemotherapy and, and, and for your audience that, that doesn't know, you know, chemotherapy goes in and attacks cancer. It actually attacks the cancer. I am now on a clinical trial drug that does nothing to the cancer, but the way cancer proliferates in the body is that it secretes a protein that hides itself from your immune system. And what this drug does is it wipes away that protein so that your body can say, oh, that's cancer. It doesn't belong here. We should go attack it. And so that's the clinical trial drug that I'm on now. I go every three weeks to the hospital. I'm, in, I'm at the hospital every day for a week. I get the infusion of this drug, it's very um, it's very hard on my body. I I shake pretty violently. I throw up. I have a headache. I have a fever. I have all these kind of things, and it's probably not going to save my life. It has stabilized my cancer, but it has not gotten rid of it. I still have the tumors in my lungs. But the way I look at it, and 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 this, I think I learned. You know, I started playing basketball when I was nine years old, and I played all the way up until I graduated from college. And I think one of the things that team sports teaches you is the importance of being part of something that's bigger than yourself. And you realize that on a team, you don't do your job. Not only do you let yourself down, but you let your teammates down, your coaches down, your fans down, et cetera. And if you think about it, the biggest team game that we all play is this game of life. So this drug may not save my life, but it may save the life of somebody you know, five years from now, 10 years from now that, that I will never meet because more than likely I won't be here. But for me, that's being part of something that's bigger than yourself. But 
Terry, that's pretty beautiful. And also so um, selfless that, you know, you obviously have come to this. I mean, for you, you know, you're going to live the best life that you can for where you're at. And, and you have, you know, and that's amazing. And I can, and I know you're saying now you've switched over to this motivational speaking, but you're trying to make a difference for other people long-term and you're trying to live the best life you can, as long as God lets you, whoever, you know, above, right. above, like lets you. And I think that is a pivot and a different way of uh, mindset that I, I think that people do need to hear and people need to understand that uh, there's, you know, no, we don't have control of it at all, but we can at least try to do the best that we can in the time that we have, you know. I, I agree. I, I had a nurse recently asked me, she said, you know, what's been the hardest thing about having your foot amputated and having your leg amputated? And I told her, I said, it's, you know, don't get me wrong. It, it certainly hasn't been easy. You know, learning to walk when you're a little kid is so much different learning to walk with a prosthetic when you're prosthetic. one, you know, in your 60s and two, you're six foot eight. You know, falling is not an option at my age. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm going to get hurt. But what I told her was, is that, you know, cancer can take all my physical faculties, but cancer can't touch my mind. It can't touch my heart and it can't touch my soul. And that's who I am. That's who you are. That's who your audience is. This is just a house or a vessel or whatever you want to call it to house who we really are. So, you know, I don't get too excited when people are like, oh, you're going to lose your hair or, you know, I mean, my entire lower body is nothing but scars and they're ugly, but you know what? I earned them. I earned those scars. And so for me, yeah, it's not great to look at, but I'm proud of what I've been through and where I am right now. Oh, that's, I mean, that's amazing for, I know that you probably have like rough days and good and bad days and, and to get past that and to talk to people about that. Um, at this point, has it been when you are now that you've pivoted and now you're doing motivational and talking to people, you know what it is like to be on your hardest days and now to transition, to tell people that do they, are they receptive that when you're trying people to are, yeah. I, I mean, I do I it. Think I think so. I mean, I, you're, you're motivating to me to say, you know, you're understanding like that. So as I talk about integrative health that we talked right before and inner health is, it's just a word, right. But really I, as I really count them, it's, it's like energy is not created or destroyed. So, and the faith in the things that are beyond it's so much more than one pill and so much more than just your treatments. And, and I can hear that in your voice and from what you're discussing, people need it, to- It is. And, 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 I, and I think you, you mentioned it earlier about the importance of, of mindset. And, and I try to have fun with it. Don't get me wrong. I, I mean, yeah. you know, you're looking at me right now. There's no S on my chest. I don't have a K. I mean, I have those bad days. I feel sorry for myself. Oh. I cry, I get down. I, I have those days. But when I do, I find that, you know, and we all get there, you know, we're human beings. You're, you're focusing inward. You're focusing on, oh, you know, woe is me. This is terrible. And, all. and yeah, it is. It, 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 I'm not saying it's not. But if you, if, you, if you shift your focus to something that's external, who can I help? Who can I make a difference in their life? And I, I joke about it all the time. I remember after I had my, my foot amputated, I was and, and I'll use the word walking out of the hospital. That's kind of a loose word, but I was walking out of the hospital and I was walking towards the exit and there was a woman standing there and she was, she was staring awful hard. I mean, and I looked around like she's staring and I was the only person there. So I figured she must've been staring at me. So I waited till I got right up to her. And then I looked at her and I said, don't worry, it'll grow back. And I just kept walking and I turned around and she had this look on her face like, well, will it, will it grow, will it really grow back? You know, it's oh, like, yeah. so you gotta have some fun with this. You gotta yeah. laugh at yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. The transition. I know that my friend was saying with the amputation, she had a really, she's still struggling with trying to learn how to walk and stuff like that. Me too. So I can, it can be, it can be a challenge. I know that was probably for you too at this time. I mean, it can, but you, I mean, again, you've got to have a go. Our daughter got married in October and, and I made, I was like, you know what? I'm going to walk her down the, the oh. aisle. Oh, it, so it was not pretty. I mean, you know, I'm holding on to her and she's holding on to me and she's anxious and she's pulling me. And I, I looked at her and I can't, if you pull me, I'm going to fall down. I said, you gotta, this is your day. They're looking at you. Take your time, go oh. slow because dad can't go fast right now. I did that. That was my goal. And I, I just, I, I've got to get back doing it. it it's, it, it's something that's, it's hard. And, yeah. but you know, that's, that's how you get better. That's how you deal with 
with things, you do things that are hard. When it's easy, everybody does it. Right, right, exactly. I'd like to know if you'd like to share before, you know, um, what is like a typical day for you? Like on a general, like not like, is it, a, you know, you have like a smoothie or you're exercising or you're praying or you have a journal because you're a motivation, like you are very motivating. And the fact that you obviously have a different mi- mindset or a different perspective on life than, and I want someone to hear it because I feel that, um, not whether it's your faith or a spiritualness, I'm fa- I'm also have a strong faith, but it's having faith, having spirit. What is it that you think is, is it for you for your day? So your typical day, how is that? Yeah, I, I try to get up early. I, I'm not a, I mean, I'm tired a lot, but I'm not sleepy. Okay. You know, it's not like I got to lay around or anything like that. I, I try to get up early. I'm, during treatment weeks, I'm up at usually 3.50 in the morning. I mean, that okay. starts the day, you know, to get to the hospital, to have the blood work, to talk to the doctor, to have the infusion, to, you know, go through the cycle based on what the parameters of the test mm-hmm. is, and, and then to come home. I mean, a lot of times it's a 12 hour day. And then, so you do that, you know, five days a week, and then you get time off. On the days when I'm not in in treatment, uh, again, I try to get up early. I pray for about an hour every morning. I have, uh, I've met a lot of people during these last 10 years. I, don't get me wrong, I pray for myself, absolutely. But I pray for a lot of people who, there were three of us that started on this clinical trial drug. Uh, Last year, the two people who were with me died. Uh, they passed away, the cancer came back and, and it killed them. So I'm sort of the last man standing, you know, I, I kind of feel like I'm the, the standard bearer. I kind of, you know, they're, they're with me as we go through this. So, so I pray for, for people, you know, I, I have breakfast with my wife. Then I, I start on my motive. You know, I, I probably do two or three podcasts a day. Uh, my wife and I kind of, there's a little contention between us. She's like, look, you need this time off to rest and to get your blood counts up and to do all that kind of stuff. And my response is always, hey, I'll get plenty of rest when I'm dead. So you know what? I'm going to oh, enjoy this. You know, I'm going to, because these do, these energize me. They give me a purpose. And then I spend a lot of time corresponding with people, whether it's, you know, via email or I still, I'm old fashioned. I like to write people notes and send oh, them to them beautiful. and things like that. Yeah. So I, I spend a lot of time with that. And then I read, I read a lot. I read, I, my wife will tell you, I've got like five or six books piled up on the nightstand, you know, next to the bed. Mm-hmm. And, and so, so I read, I, I, I believe learning, being lifelong learners. I want to die learning. And I think that's important. So I'm reading all kinds of different books. So in, in a nutshell, there. that's, that, that's kind of my day. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, thank you for sharing that. And, you know, I know that you've been through a lot and um, I don't want to keep you too much longer, but is there one tip or, or one small thing that you'd like to, um, I call them mindful ways that you'd like to share with the audience? I, l- l- let me finish with a story, if I may. Okay, that'd be um, great. Yeah. So I've always been a big fan of, of Westerns growing up. You know, my mom and dad used to let me stay up late and watch Bonanza and Gunsmoke. And my favorite was Wild Wild West. 1993, the movie Tombstone came out. You may have seen it. It was a, it was a huge blockbuster. It starred Val Kilmer as a man by the name of John Doc Holliday and Kurt Russell as a man by the name of Wyatt Earp. Now, Doc Holliday and Wyatt Earp were two living, breathing human beings who walked on the face of the earth. They're not made up characters for the movie. Doc was called Doc because he was a dentist by trade, but pretty much Doc Holliday was a gunslinger and a card show. And Wyatt Earp had been a lawman almost his entire adult life. And somehow these two men from entirely opposite backgrounds come together and form this very close friendship. And at the end of the movie, Doc Holliday is dying at a sanitarium in Glenwood Springs, Colorado, which is about three hours from where I live. The real Doc Holliday died at that sanitarium and he's buried in the Glenwood Springs Cemetery. And Wyatt at this point in his life is destitute. He has no money, he has no job, he has no prospects for a job. So every day he comes to play cards with Doc and the two men pass the time that way. And in this almost last scene of the movie, the two men are talking about what they want out of life. And Doc said, you know, when I was younger, I was in love with my cousin, but she joined a convent over the affair, but she's all that I ever wanted. And then he looks at Wyatt and says, what about you, Wyatt? What do you want? And Wyatt kind of nonchalantly says, I just want to lead a normal life. And Doc looks at him and says, there's no normal, there's just life. And get on with living yours. Damaris, you and I both know, there's probably people out there listening to us right now 
that are sort of just sitting back and saying, well, when this happens, I'll have a normal life. Or when this arises, I'll have a successful life. Or when this occurs, I'll have a significant life. What I'd like to leave you with is this. Don't wait. Don't wait for life to come to you. Get out there. Find the reason you were put on the face of this earth. Use your unique gifts and talents and live that reason. Because if you do, at the end of your life, I'm going to promise you two things. Number one, you're going to be a whole lot happier. And number two, you're going to have a whole lot more peace in your heart. Love that. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, it's getting me a little teary eyed. Thank you so much for sharing your time, your energy and your love. Um, and I appreciate your time. So, well, thank you for having me on. I really do. And I love for those to, of course, reach you. So can you, um, save how they can get a hold of you. I'll have information in the show notes too, but I'd love for them to also reach you. Uh, yeah, uh, I have a, um, a blog that I put up a thought for the day every day. And with that thought comes a, a question about maybe how you can employ that thought in your life. My blog is motivationalcheck.com. You can leave me a message there. I have recommendations for books and videos to watch and things like that. So motivationalcheck.com will get you to me. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Terry Tucker, for coming on and for um, bringing your wisdom, because I know that there's someone listening that needs to hear you. Well, thanks for having me on. Of course. And thank you guys for joining in. And as I say to you each and every day, find a mindful way. Have a great day.